чужим діткам долі долі. Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. I got Justin Rice, Cell Development Foundation. We're gonna talk Protocol 18. I'm really excited about this one. It is going to be, uh, they say one of the biggest to date. Let's find out more. Protocol 18 upgrade. So this quarter, We've been heads down working on protocol 18 and helping the ecosystem prepare for the network upgrade vote, which is scheduled for November 3rd. Protocol 18 is the most significant upgrade to Stellar since its inception because it adds a powerful new feature that has the potential to transform the network, the ability to create automated market makers or AMNs. Ooh, woo! Mr. Justin Rice, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm just so excited. I'm really excited because this is all about Protocol 18. And you just said in that clip that this is the biggest upgrade to the Stellar Protocol since the inception. You still feel that way? I feel that way. I think that Protocol 18 could really transform the network by basically oh. making it so that there's like liquidity for every asset on the Stellar network, which would really boost like its ability to connect the world's financial infrastructure and make Stellar a platform for universal asset exchange. So yes, it's a big change that could have Ooh. really positive impacts. One more time. This is good. This is good. I'm excited. I'm excited. So Justin, let's start off. Let me uh, allow you to reintroduce yourself, as Jay-Z would always say in his songs, to the community. Uh, who are you? What's your title at the Stellar Development Foundation? Let's start with that. Sure. I'm Justin Rice. I am the VP of Ecosystem at the Stellar Development Foundation. And that means that uh, me and my team, we work to help uh, enterprises and developers understand how to use Stellar and optimize their use of the network to get things done. Um, and a lot of what I've been working on lately is trying to get people to understand this new protocol upgrade, protocol 18, uh, and to prepare for it. So it's pretty, pretty exciting because I get to talk to the ecosystem a lot. Nah, I love it. I love it. Shout out to Jeremy. He said, before this podcast ends, I want to know all the stuff that's on your walls. No, Jeremy. <laughs> no, I'll just say I it's all from garage sales. It's all from nice. garage sales. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, hey, but you know what? Um, you know, I, you know, you know, we start off with an introduction, and I think it's important because one thing that I've I've realized, especially recently, I mean, Stellar's been all over the map. It, you know, on every single panel, news, etc., with big announcements. There are a lot of new people that are within the Stellar family, and so I, I think that it's important to start this off to understands, I guess, you know, let's start off with the st uh, Stellar Decentralized Exchange, right? Because I, I think that's an, an important topic to understand before we 
kind of dive into the importance of AMMs and liquidity pools, etc. So, um, can you summarize what the SDEX uh, is and explain its purpose? Yeah, great question. So, Stellar is designed to connect the world's financial infrastructure. And the way that it does that that is it makes it really easy assets. So people issue assets on Stellar that represent real world assets. But for those assets to really interact, you need to be able to exchange them, right? You need to be able to uh, take an asset in one location and convert it in another location to, to, to the asset that makes sense in the actual region where people are using that asset. So the Stellar Decentral, like in addition to sort of allowing people to have accounts on the ledger that store balances, Stellar was designed with a decentralized exchange. Essentially, you can create orders to buy or sell one asset for another, and those orders persist and are pooled together into order books. And when orders cross, they execute. So automatically, Stellar has, is a, has a built-in mechanism for asset exchange, uh, and it is these order books. And they work very much like traditional order books in traditional exchanges, except for the fact that they're decentralized, right? Like there is no specific counterparty. There's no one controlling the order books. They are created by um, account level on-chain orders that are aggregated together into books and that autonomously uh, execute when orders cross. Nice. But again, it's really important because if you can issue different assets that represent real world currencies on Stellar, it's vital for those assets to be able to be exchanged, especially if you want to do things like make a cross-border payment. So if I want to send USD to someone in Nigeria and they get NGN, Nigerian Naira, in return, the way to do that in a decentralized fashion using Stellar is for me to actually hold USD, have them make a payment that goes gets rooted through an exchange, and that USD gets converted along the way to NGN so that the end recipients gets the currency that they want. And that's what Stellar allows, right, by allowing universal asset issuance and a mechanism for universal asset exchange, it allows all of the different currency endpoints in the world to connect, to allow for payments across cultures, across borders, across currencies. That's that's major. That's major. And I'm, I'm glad you took the time to explain that because, you know, I, to me, that's what makes Stellar so unique is that ability that you don't have to um, you don't have to depend on a, a centralized exchange or entities to, to make this work. Um, this whole decentralized network, I think, is just so powerful. One of the reasons why I am so excited uh, about the Stellar Development Foundation's work um, as far as expanding this. Um, so you, you talked about the order books. Um, explain a little bit more on path payments because that's a very uh, that, that's another very powerful feature that Stellar has. Uh, can you can you explain uh, how path payments fits into what you just described? Sure. In fact, the the payment that I just described, where I send USD and the recipient gets NGN on the other end, would take advantage of a specific Stellar operation called a path payment. And a path payment essentially combines a payment and a value conversion by routing a payment through the sort of internal order books or soon through AMMs um, in order to convert value and send it at the same time. And so path payments are essentially an atomic way on the ledger to easily uh, make a cross-border cross-currency payment. Wow. Wow. No, I, I was doing a show. I was doing a show with uh, Fred over at Lightman. Shout out to the whole Lightman NFT artist community out there. And uh, it was pretty neat because, you know, Basically, we used a uh, an asset from D stock and was able to utilize that in his store to make a purchase, you know. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it just opens up a lot of creative uses. Um, so, I mean, this system of order books, as I said, is, is very, I guess, familiar in traditional uh, exchanges. Right. You know, if you go on one of the, any of these centralized exchanges, it's very similar. Um, you know, I guess. You know, the question is, I mean, what were some of the issues that the SDEX was running into at the time um, that, I guess, made the order book function um, not work as smooth? So order books work really well in certain circumstances. And I think you're correct that the mental model of an order book is familiar to a lot of people. Essentially, right. you can put orders to buy an asset and orders to sell an asset at different prices. And in between is sort of like the mid-market price. When the orders cross, they execute and create a trade. The issue is that many of the assets on Stellar are um, pegged to assets in the real world. And so when you're, um, in order to create order books on Stellar, well, first of all, 
the creation of order books means that you have to have actual capital in hand in order to place orders on both sides of the book. So you need to actually have assets to sell and you need to have on, on the other hand, like the ability to buy assets. So you have to have inventory in stock. And when you're trying to maintain those order books, um, as people consume orders on both sides, you have to constantly sort of restock. And because many of the assets on Stellar are pegged to assets in the real world, people who are trying to maintain those order books, um, they often have to update their orders quite frequently because they need to keep sort of the prices that exist on the Stellar de decks um, mm -hmm. sort of in par parallel or are in sync with prices that exist on other exchanges. And so as a result, when you're trying to create liquidity on order books, there is complexity because you have to um, sort of understand what's going on in the world there, and you have to manage a lot of operations to constantly sort of update your orders on the order books. And it requires a, a, you know, a fair amount of capital in order to place the orders and to leave them sitting there. And so as a result, um, the people who make orders, make markets on the order books, who provide these orders on the order books tend to be professional market makers, people who have the, the capital and the sort of capacity to constantly manage these orders and update them. They do it generally because they're drawn to markets that have high volume, that have a spread where they can execute, they can, a, a lot of trades execute and they, um, professional market makers tend to make money off of the spread between the bid and the ask. And so what you end up with with order books um, is a world, uh, is an, as part of the Stellar ecosystem, a world of third party market makers who come in to make those books and they tend to focus on certain liquidity pairs, but not others. And the liquidity mm. pairs that they tend to focus on are the ones that have a high volume of trading. And so uh, market order books are great. Um, they attract professional market makers into the ecosystem, but those market makers do not give the same focus to all kinds of liquidity pairs. And so you end up with good liquidity in some markets and a lack of good liquidity in other markets. It makes sense. Yeah, because I remember at one point, you know, and I don't know if it's still going on right now, but but there were market makers involved in the in the Stellar decentralized exchange at one point. And, and I guess that answers why they might have been, you know, it wasn't as successful or wasn't as smooth. And, and that didn't really solve the liquidity problem on its own. Yeah, there are uh, there, there are, you know, third party market makers that are part of the Stellar ecosystem that place orders on the Stellar decks today that make markets okay. today. Um, but the thing is that they're not going to make every market and the people that can participate in providing liquidity as, as market makers using order books, it requires a, a pretty high level of sophistication and capital. And so, you know, so we're, this is part of why we decided to introduce AMMs as a parallel source of liquidity. So mm -hmm. we can talk about what those are in a second, but automated market makers, the order book is great for professional market makers but it sort of limits participation in any meaningful way to people who have expertise, sophisticated operations to update orders constantly in a fair amount of capital. And automated market makers simplify the process and make it so that they can democratize um, the participation in liquidity or liquidity provision by making it simpler and cheaper to actually provide liquidity to markets. So that's the thing. The, the SDEX has its advantages and it will continue to function even after protocol 18 alongside these automated market makers. Um, but it sort of serves a different purpose. It's for these markets that already, that it's for markets where professional market makers can provide liquidity and depth because it makes sense for their businesses. Makes sense, makes sense. So AMMs for everyone listening in, they're automatic market makers. Now, AMMs have, you know, they've been around for a while, not new. Um, in fact, they were really widely popular on, on Ethereum. Um, why is it, do you think that it, it was so successful on that network? I mean, what, what did you guys, I guess, look at and, and were able to, to observe from that and take away? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I'd say an automated market maker like a conventional market maker is a, is a way to provide liquidity. Um, but mm -hmm. rather than having the, the sort of prices determined by the spread between orders on the order book, um, the prices, the quoted prices are determined by a mathematical equation. So an automated market maker essentially holds different assets in the liquidity pool, a pair of assets generally, um, and those assets which are called reserves. 
They basically serve as inputs to an equation. And the prices that the automated market maker quotes to someone who wants to trade against the automated market maker are based on that equation. Um, essentially, they, they can democratize market making by letting any eligible participant deposit assets into the liquidity pool. And in return, a depositor receives pool shares um, that represent their uh, ownership of the assets in the pool. Okay. The pool, when people trade against the pool, they essentially inc incur a fee. Um, and so the pool collects fees. And what we've seen on networks like Ethereum is that people who deposit into, is that um, automated market makers can democratize uh, uh, liquidity provision and attract liquidity because people deposit into them and depositors can potentially uh, gain fees or accrue, accrue fees when um, people trade against the automated market makers. So as a result, you've seen in, in on other chains, you know, in, in other on uh, automated market makers that are built on Ethereum, there's been a lot of capital that has gone in um, to create these very deep markets that allow for a lot of trading to happen at, mm -hmm. at, because the, and because the markets are very liquid, the rates at which people can trade against AMNs are, are, are good. And so right. the idea is that by introducing them in parallel to the DEX on Stellar, you essentially create a method for users to deposit into liquidity pools and generate liquidity for the network. And because it's a simple operation uh, and because you don't have to constantly manage your orders because the, the automated market maker does it based on, on the formula, um, it becomes quite easy to deposit liquidity and and so it can attract a sort of more democratic breed of market maker. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, going back to, you know, I, I guess comparing what Stellar is doing to others, um, were there any weaknesses that you that you observe, let's say, on the Ethereum network that um, that I guess when you, when you look at how it could work on Stellar, you know, uh, I guess create some advantages on our end. Yeah, uh, Stellar has some. There are some really interesting things about AMMs on Stellar. So I think you said this, but Stellar is the first layer one blockchain to incorporate AMMs at the protocol level. Um, okay. What that means is that AMMs are just a simple operation that you can. And there are all these different um, people in the ecosystem that are already building interfaces or integrating interfaces into their. Um, into their wallets or exchange interfaces, right? That allow you to deposit liquidity with a simple click of a button. Um, what under the hood, because it's happening at the protocol level, the operation is pretty quick and simple, and it doesn't rely on complicated smart contracts. More mm. importantly, however, um, when you deposit uh, liquidity, when you like any Ethereum transaction, when you deposit liquidity in a, a, a name and built on Ethereum the transaction fees are, are really high. The gas fees are really high. And so in Stellar, the transaction fees are incredibly low. We're talking fractions of a cent. And so I think that that means that people who want to deposit liquidity, it becomes a lot easier for them or a lot just more effective for them to be able to deposit small amounts, right? You don't pay $15, $20, $30 $30 to, to, for a transaction. You pay a fraction right. of a cent. And that means that you can deposit small amounts of liquidity. And I think that further democratizes the sort of market making that liquidity pools allow for. And then finally, because they're built in at the protocol level, and we already talked about path payments, right? Path payments are actual cross-border payments. They, uh, you make a payment that originates in one currency and arrives in its destination in a different currency, and along the way it's converted. Um, path payments on Stellar will now have the, will now route through the DEX or through AMMs, whichever one provides the better conversion rate. And that means that um, path payments become a transaction source for liquidity pools. And so basically stellar liquidity pools, in addition to being simple and not built on smart contracts and cheap, they also serve to actually create liquidity for real cross-border payments. And they derive transactions from those cross-border payments. And that's not true of any other liquidity pool out there. Sam, I can't hear you. Thanks. So let me ask you this. I mean, when we kind of look at this, how do you feel that this can open up liquidity on Stellar? Great question. So 
you know, liquidity really comes from having a depth of, of orders, right? It comes from capital that is being put into onto the network in order to facilitate asset conversion. And what happens with uh, the order books right now is that there is liquidity. It's put there by people that place orders on the books and leave them there. With automated market makers, individual users will be able to pool liquidity. And because it's an easy thing to do and you can, you can basically accrue a lot of small deposits, there's potential for there to be more liquidity in these pools, even that exists on the decks and or for there to be liquidity for asset pairs that don't currently get serviced by, by uh, professional market makers. Hmm. Once those, that liquidity exists, right, basically the path payment operation is, has been repurposed. And now when you make a path payment, say I want to, as we've sort of used the example before, if I want to send USD and have my friend receive it in NGN, when I make that operation on Stellar and I say I want to make a path payment that changes, that goes from me to my friend and converts from USD to NGN along the way, the path payment will now look at the DEX rate it would get for doing that conversion if it like sort of consumed orders on the on the order books. And it will look at the AMM and see what, it, what rate it got if it traded against that. And because there is like, because AMMs have the potential to bring more liquidity, right? They can improve the prices for something like a path payment, right? They can give it more, the, uh, increase the ability for it to consume orders in order to convert USD to NGN. And to, and like sort of the more, the way that liquidity works, the deeper a market is, the more people are willing to sort of make trades um, or put trades on the books that can be consumed it generally is favorable for, uh, for it prevents slippage. Um, it leads to essentially uh, uh, markets that provide better rates or, or more reasonable rates for um, FX conversion for, for the conversion from one asset to another. Does that make sense? No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's, it's really putting stellar into, I mean, the Forex market in many ways, you know, it's, it's, it's really allowing, you know, just, just the ability to expand i can see a lot of more assets coming to the network um i i, I can see a lot of even you know i think what, what i think would be really cool is that even you know smaller markets right it's it's kind of that flexibility where you know whether you're a company maybe your your community um you know small country and you want to try to come in and utilize the stellar decks in an open source environment um you have a lot of really cool tools so i'm excited to see that um, you know, one thing I did want to, you know, to, to touch on is, you know, if we can kind of briefly go through um, the route that this all took, because, I mean, it, it's not like the Stellar Development Foundation just simply decided this is going to happen. I mean, this is a, a, a community democratic process. So um, can you maybe go through, you know, the the steps from, you know, that, you know, the core advancement protocols go through? Absolutely. Yeah. Stellar is open source and it is not created or run by a single organization. Um, the code evolves based on the needs of the ecosystem. And there is definitely a process that, it, that things go through before they're implemented or released. So the way that something like this happens is that people who are building on Stellar, people in the Stellar ecosystem generally will see a, a need for a, a new feature um, for Stellar to do for the actual, you know, say Stellar core code, um, which is the code that the nodes that, that sort of keep the Stellar network run to talk to one another and ratify changes to the ledger, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the ecosystem will say Stellar needs to do something that it doesn't currently do. And then there is a long process where it's that sort of discussion will start. And a lot of the times it happens on an open participation mailing list, the Stellar developer Google group. Um, that discussion often will sort of foment for a while and people will go back and forth talking about some desired uh, need for the ecosystem, for the protocol to evolve to meet an ecosystem need. And then eventually someone will draft what's called a core advancement proposal. Um, and then this kicks off a, a formal process uh, that ends um, with, and, and we'll sort of walk through that process really quickly, but it, 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 there, there are a number of steps that it takes all in the open and through with like sort of community input and uh, the ecosystem's participation that are required for that idea to finally make it into a version of Stellar Core and finally have that that protocol actually go live on the network. So essentially, it starts with a proposal. 
That proposal is debated and discussed on that mailing list and on GitHub. Um, usually there are several iterations and revisions. Once a proposal is sort of gotten to the point where it's settled and all the feedback has been taken into account, um, a committee will approve uh, a, a core advancement proposal. And then there'll be a week of, of final comment period where people in the ecosystem have the opportunity to raise final objections. And if they raise objections, it will sort of reopen the process. If they don't, then the core advancement proposal will be marked as final um, or as accepted, I mean. And then uh, the Stellar Core team will start implementing it in Stellar Core. Eventually, when they're done implementing it, like taking the actual proposal and turning it into functional code, it will be uh, released as a major Stellar Core release, which is then put out and the validators on the network essentially vote on whether the network should run that version of Stellar Core. So it sort of starts with an idea and discussion, goes through iteration of feedback, goes through a final comment period, goes through implementation, and then ultimately network validators have to vote to accept the change. What's and interesting vote, in this- and, and, and that vote is gonna take place November 3rd, right? Yes, that vote is a week from tomorrow. So the the where we are right now in that process is that almost all of it's done. It's been actually the Stellar Core release is out. The network upgrade vote is a week from tomorrow, November third. Wow. Incidentally, anyone listening um, <laughs> should upgrade all of their Stellar related software, including SDKs that you use, because if validators vote to upgrade the network, essentially it will turn on all the protocol eighteen features. Mm -hmm. um, and once that happens, if you're running out of date software, it will scramble your software's brain. And so uh, you'll start to get errors. So if you install software that can actually basically understand protocol 18 now, if and when the, the uh, validators vote to upgrade the network, your software will have no problem. So um, yeah, Sam is actually showing us here a protocol 18 upgrade guide that will walk make everyone sure you, through that process. Yeah. Make sure you go check this out. You don't want to get stuck. <laughs> Now, um, you know, on, on this, um, I want to I wanted to circle back um, as you were talking. A, a question, a thought came to my mind. Uh, it, it, you know, going back, you know, to proposals and how everything is is kind of generated. When the AMM uh, discussion first started off, if I'm not mistaken, there were two uh, core advancement proposals drafted. There was Cap 37 and Cap 38. Um, do you mind taking a couple minutes to just, I guess, share how they differed and ultimately the decision made to go with cap 38? Yes. Um, so this was a really interesting example because that generally doesn't happen where there are two different proposals to achieve the same end, but because there was so much interest in the ecosystem in creating or bringing AMMs to the stellar protocol, two independent organizations or two independent parties. One was um, Orbit Lens from Stellar Expert and one was uh, Jonathan Joe from SDF came up with proposals that would essentially implement AMM's uh, functionality at the protocol level. In many ways, these proposals were very, very similar. They had the same objective. They had a lot of the same uh, structure. And fundamentally, the biggest difference between them had to do with order routing. And essentially, CAP38 um, had what, what's called interleaved execution and cap, uh, sorry, cap 37 had interleaved execution and cap 38 had best venue execution. Short version of what this is, as I said, to actually you like consume liquidity in a, a, that's generated by AMMs, you use a path payment, right? So you say, I want to send uh, a payment that originates in an asset in one asset and arrives in its destination and another will get rooted through um, these markets for exchange. Cap mm -hmm. 37 essentially said that the order would bounce back and forth between the decentralized exchange and the liquidity pool um, okay. within uh, to, to make a trade. Um, and it would incrementally consume from each. Whereas Cap 38 essentially said an order will look at the best, will look at both the decks, the overall rate for an exchange on the decks, and the overall rate provided by a liquidity pool and choose whichever is best, whichever venue is best. There were advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. Ultimately, the um, core advancement proposal committee decided to go with CAP 38, which is the best venue approach. The reason why they decided to do that was because it, it was simpler. It's simpler from a user perspective. It's very similar from an implementer perspective and a tester perspective. 
um, it was a lot faster and simpler to create and implement and put out there. And it can, in the future, it can be adapted to be more complex, to add the complexity that was in CAP 37. That can happen later. And the general idea when making a, a change to Stellar Core is start simple and then make it more complex as necessary based on what the ecosystem actually needs. And so that was basically the decision. CAP 37 was more complicated. CAP 38 was simpler. Let's start simple and see if we need to evolve to more complicated once we have some information from people actually using the protocol. I, I, I love the way that that works. And, you know, I look at a lot of different, you know, protocols. I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else really operates with the openness and flexibility that uh, Stellar offers. Because, I mean, look at it. We're talking about, you know, Cap 38. And I already know there's other proposals beyond 38 that's already out there for different things. Um, we're on protocol upgrade uh, 18. Uh, I mean, I just think it's really fascinating that there's that flexibility and adaptability that exists. So, you know, so yeah. So shout out to Orbit Lens, by the way. I, I, you know, uh, I remember when that blog post came out, um, you know, it was it was very insightful and uh, look forward to seeing how things evolve. Um, now, going back to also something that you said earlier uh, was that uh, Protocol 18 will make um, sell the first L1 blockchain to integrate AMM capability. So first of all, I guess, let me back back up a little bit. What is actually happening on Ethereum? So that's not layer one that's happening there. Is that, that's, uh, is that like a layer two third party that's, you know, when we, let's say like Uniswap as an example. Yeah, I mean, Ethereum works different differently than Stellar insofar as like the, the sort of layer one of, of Ethereum has smart contracting capabilities. You can execute code on Ethereum and that allows you to build these sort of layer two tech, um, I'd say platforms that take the ability to run code in Ethereum and then turn them into something else. And that's essentially what um, automated market makers that are built on top of Ethereum do. They're not built into Ethereum itself. Someone has created a platform that takes advantage of Ethereum smart contracting capability to do something. Um, and when you, you know, as a result of that, it means that you, in many ways, have to tr have to trust or understand the smart contract that's being executed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like any computer program, uh, where you know there can be errors, there can be attack vectors. Um, and so when you're building an L2, like basically on top of Ethereum and you're creating smart contracts to execute these functions that allow for automated market making, um, it's definitely people have done a great job doing it. Um, and a lot of people who use those AMMs can you know, vet, audit, understand the code. But, uh, but it is a more sort of complicated uh, thing to do. It's a lot like um, Stellar is really makes it really easy to issue an asset. You can do it in a couple of lines of code. And then that asset right. is essentially kind of like adding a ledger entry, right? You say now there's an asset on the ledger. On Ethereum, assets are these are much more complicated because they're these computer, pro these contracts that sort of specify the creation of an asset. Um, so they're a bit more like funky. They're, they're a bit more gnarly and they're a bit more opaque. Um, Versus having things built in at the protocol level is very streamlined. It's a lot easier to like sort of reason about. And it's also easier to look at, um, at least from my perspective. Like it's much easier for me to see what's going on at the protocol level than it is to actually dissect some layer two that's built on top of the protocol to understand what's happening. First of all, I completely agree with you. And second of all, I think it's really cool that you incorporate a gnarly into the discussion. I, 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 me personally, I thought that was great. I love it. I love it. Um, no, that, that, that's great. I mean, I think you, you kind of really put it on the head. Um, let me put you on the spot a little bit. Um, could you describe maybe, I guess, some real world applications that uh, scenarios that, you know, might take advantage should uh, Protocol 18 get, get voted, voted in? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about the way that Stellar works generally is that SDF works with the ecosystem to make these changes at the protocol level, but it's really developers building on top of Stellar that take advantage of protocol level changes to create products and services that touch consumers. So, you know, protocol 18 adds AMM support or AMM functionality, but it's really 
these people there will be people out there building interfaces or integrating interfaces into their wallets or applications that will actually allow users to deposit into liquidity pools and it's also those same people that will be allowing people to make path payments that consume the liquidity in liquidity pools and so generally i think that what i can tell you that there are already we to in advance of protocol 18 we at scf started working with the ecosystem early and we released a bunch of early resources right we released a, a spec for how the api is going to work early we released a future net before the test net we mm. basically detail we created a mock api environment for people to start building and we shared it with the ecosystem and i can say that on you know a week from tomorrow when if the protocol vote goes through and the network upgrades Several ecosystem companies will have interfaces that will allow users to access liquidity pools from day one, and it will allow mm -hmm. users to trade against liquidity pools from day one. What I can say by looking at those interfaces is that suddenly there are um, just in any given application or Stellar wallet, you can add the you can give user the uh, a user the option to deposit liquidity, and mm -hmm. I think that. The question, the big question is, what do you, you know, what are the use? Basically, in and of itself, that's kind of a use case, right? Yeah, I have, I, I have assets, you know, I have assets that I hold in a Stellar wallet, and now with the click of a button, I can de use those, deploy those assets, and contribute liquidity, right? Um, the ease with which that that they can, people can integrate that into existing Stellar functionality, I think, is going to be the biggest, like way that that people get access that like sort of the biggest transformation um and i think a lot of that will from the user perspective will be quite seamless just like suddenly there will be added functionality to some product or service that you already use that said i think that when we release this amm at the protocol level it's a very um you know like i said pr uh, cap 38 was sort of an mvp uh, a simplified version of what amms could be on stellar and i think what will happen is that we will start to see as an ecosystem how people are deploying and using this new functionality and continue to evolve the protocol to um, uh, to basically meet the sort of requirements of people building on Stellar. And so I think what we'll start to see will range a, sort of across a range of DeFi products, right? It will allow people to deposit. It will allow sort of savings app. It could allow lending app. I don't know, lending apps. It could allow people to better sort of deploy or have more versatility with assets that they hold in a Stellar wallet. Mm. But what's cool is that what people do with AMMs, what the ecosystem decides to do, a lot of that is up to them. It's a new tool. And so what are people going to build? I, I don't know. I'm excited to find <laughs> out. And That'll it's totally the not the thing. Right. And it's cool because like, it's not up to me, right? It's, it's up to the people out there listening who are going to experiment to like figure out what what is the best thing to build and then they will tell me they will tell you they will tell the world right, right? oh yeah i mean no i mean I, I see people in the comments you know there's there's tons of projects that are utilizing that that are that have products i mean i know that i've got the opportunity to test out several different uh companies that are building on stellar and what they're offering and i mean it's really exciting because you know i, I think for a lot of especially the community members you know, um, it really puts, I guess, Stellar into motion, right? It really puts Stellar into motion for a, a lot of folks. And I'm excited to see the evolution of wallets, like you just mentioned, right? It's, you know, you have these Stellar wallets and all of a sudden now, those wallets are going to become extremely powerful. You'll be able to do so much, uh, you know, right in the palm of your hand, you know, right on an extension on your computer browser, that uh it just doesn't exist and i think that you know what really excites me is you know you know on even on on other protocols i you know i'm using ethereum as an example you know a lot of what they use is, is really strictly you know crypto to crypto assets um with stellar you know you have this ability of regulated assets currencies you know i i'm with you i i'm gonna be sitting back and you know, it's kind of like I, I remember, uh, you know, a couple years ago uh, in New York running into Jed and, and someone asked him, you know, what he's what he's excited about. And he used the analogy of the Internet. Right. He said that, you know, when the Internet first started, you know, you couldn't imagine Uber or, uh, 
you know, you know, Airbnb being done on the internet. Like you couldn't have imagined that. And, and that's the same thing that you're saying with Stellar and, and Protocol 18 is it's, it's going to unleash a lot of great creativity. Um, so I'm excited with you. Um, be, be, before we, 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 uh, sign off here, I wanted to go back and just make sure we recap, um, what people need to be aware of, um, a for the vote coming up. And, you know, if you're, you're running a validator, what are some of the key things you need to, you know, be aware of? Um, I'm pulling up here. This is the protocol 18 upgrade guide folks, if you're watching. So, uh, Justin, yeah, if you can just highlight some of the things here that need to be, uh, pay attention to, um, I, I think that'd be great here and we could wrap up. Great. Yeah. So the protocol 18 upgrade guide will tell everyone all of the details about what they, what they need to know about upgrading to protocol 18. Actually, if you scroll to the top, Sam, I think it, the very, very top all the way up, this is the high level message protocol 18 introduces breaking changes. So make sure to install up-to-date software, including SDKs before mm -hmm. November 3rd, 2021. So that's the first thing, everybody, right. if you're listening and you run Stellar, whether you run Stellar Core, Horizon, or a Stellar SDK, or any combination, just go install the up-to-date version. And therefore, if and when validators vote to upgrade, your stuff won't break. It will just sail right through the protocol 18 <laughs> upgrade. There you go. Then I, th I think the second thing is if you run a validator and you want to arm it to vote, there's a command down here um, that says, you know, where you basically tell your validator, hey, on a certain time, and I think if you scroll down to if you run Stellar Core, it'll say it. Um, there you go. If you run Stellar Core, you use this upgrades question mark mode equals set and upgrade time. And you're basically, you're saying my node at this time of 2021, uh, November 3rd, 2021 at 1500 UTC will say start running protocol version 18. So if you run a, a validating node, you should make sure to arm your node if you want to vote for the upgrade. And that's basically it. Install up to, up to date software and make sure to arm your node. And then you know, the rest of what this guy gets into is like sort of any specific other questions that you might have. Once that's done, right, like you can, as, as a Stellar developer, um, you know, you can choose to build on AMMs or you can choose to ignore them. But you need to Who be would want to do that? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you, hey, maybe you want to think about AMMs in six months. You know, maybe you want to start, yeah, like many okay. people have started building now and many products are going to launch. And if you're a developer and you're building one of those products, you probably already know all this stuff. If you're like, maybe I'll think I'm a developer and I'm going to think about it later, still upgrade your software now because otherwise you'll get errors. And then, you know, later on, you'll be in great shape to start developing around AMMs. For like consumers, who people who are out there, Stellar users who want to, who are interested in AMMs, um, there are a couple of interfaces uh, in the ecosystem that have been working and are planning to re do launch releases on... Uh, on November 3rd. And so just like stay tuned for those. And then you'll be able to open up your Stellar wallet and you know use the interface that they built to interact with AMMs. And uh, you know, all this will be all that many of you know, all of these things will sort of be happening next week, which is crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. And to uh, I, I'm excited. I'm sure a lot of people are as well to start to actually see this uh, stellar decentralized exchange come to life. Um, and uh, I, I'm just I'm hoping I, I can't wait. I'm not sure who is slated to launch first, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure that we'll see the announcements. And I'm definitely going to be retweeting and sharing the announcements as, as, as all of these uh, companies drop their products utilizing um, this new AMM feature. Um, this is, this is great though. I mean, I really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to, to go through this. I think we covered a lot of information. Um, any, any final words? I mean, I, I think we covered it all. I can't think of anything else we're missing here. No, I think we covered it all. I mean, I would say that people out there, if you have like feedback, I, I think once AMMs launch, um, the more that people are talking about them, the more that people are sharing feedback, the more that people building products and services that take advantage of them will understand like what's working for users and what's not. I think this is a great time for us to all like to come together and work together to like make ecosystem wide improvements. And I think that if we do that, we'll end up with some really cool products and ideally a, a big boost to network liquidity. And so this is just like sort of a shout out and a, 
a sort of call to action for the entire community to be like, to be out there, to be trying stuff, to be giving your feedback. Um, it is all a collective effort that makes this stuff work. I agree. Um, you know, if you're out there, I know I see a lot of people, you know, talking about different, different projects, you know, reach out to them because, you know, all of the ones that are seriously, you know, you know, building on this, they have betas that are ready and live. And so reach out to, uh, you know, if there's a company or all the companies really just, you know, reach out to all of them, find out about their beta, see if it's live. Cause I know that there's several that are already live right now. So get involved, use it, give feedback. Um, so that way, I mean, Hey, the more feedback, the better it is for you, the better it is for the, the community and the better for stellar as a whole. So, uh, I think those are great, great words. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, tomorrow folks that are listening, I've got, um, a show coming up. We're going to talk about DAOs that are coming to, uh, the stellar ecosystem. Uh, Brian Goldberg, that's going to be tomorrow. And, uh, guess what? I got word that I may be talking to someone very special named Danell Dixon. So, ah, uh, stay tuned for that one, folks. Hey, Justin, I appreciate you uh, so much for stopping by again, and uh, we'll touch base after it goes live and 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 see how things are th things th see how things are progressing. It's going to be really exciting to see this in in the real world and real use. Thanks, Sam. Pleasure as always. All right, everybody, you guys take care. Let's go.